Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the piano tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Piano Tech Radio Hour. The world's largest online collection of piano nerds. Yes, all nerding we as one in all one nerding. <laughs> all nerding as one. Happy yeah. Halloween. Mr. Stephen Brady is here today. He, he inspired me with his mask to go get mine. And they both inspired me to never, ever wear a mask ever again. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, all right. I'm going to give a quick intro and then we'll get started. We like to get down to business here. So, um, yeah. On today's radio hour, I just want to remind you that we are brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclass is an online educational resource that does offer you cutting edge instruction from piano and industry masters without leaving your home. You can always find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And a special announcement before I introduce our lovely guest today, and that is we finally have a page where you can sign up for our convention in December. 10th to 12th of December, we're doing three master classes every day. One of them will actually be Stephen Brady, who's our guest today. Yay. Looks like he'll be teaching us about dampers, which I'm excited about, although I'm leaving him the opening to change that if he wants <laughs> while we're talking today. <laughs> but he's going to give an excellent class no matter what. So there's a page where you can sign up. I just put that in the chat. There's a special rate until November 10th. So make sure you get in early. You'll definitely get the best op opportunities available. Let me give a quick introduction to Steve and then we'll jump in. He's a award-winning piano technician and respected PTG veteran, along with securing a place in the PTG Hall of Fame. He was awarded the PTG's Golden Hammer Award, which he swiftly sold at a, uh, at a, pawn shop to help pay pay for uh, his phone bill but uh he's it, that is one of the profession's highest honors and he won that for his contributions to the piano industry just kidding i think i've seen it on his mantle or something um he is the author of under the lid the art and craft of concert piano technician and he re resides in seattle washington steve it's so great to have you here on piano tech radio hour again how are you doing today it's i'm doing great it's good to be here I think uh, I'm going to remove my mask now, so you can see uh, you can see who I am. Yeah. Um, I got another mask that I I like because it looks a lot like me. I'm going <laughs> to leave both of these off for now. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Well, Very nice. I should have asked people to dress up, actually. The problem is I've, I've got hearing aids now, and I've, they're getting tangled up. Okay. Wow. Well, Just out real quick, folks. I met Steve Brady, what, 15 years ago? He walked into my backyard, and we spent the next six hours, like, just deep engaged in talk and reverie. I remember that. that. That was really fun. We talked about everything. And then we found out that uh, our birthdays are exactly one year and one day apart or yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Something like that. It's, it's, it's amazing. Whatever. But anyway. I thought I'd like to talk a little bit today about business. Has anyone talked about that recently on the radio hour? 
No, not exactly. We touch upon it here and there. Our our probably hottest episode was with um with Carl Lieberman, Lieberman. talked a little bit yes. about business. But yeah, that'd be really fun if you wanna wanna yeah, bring some that was, that was one business of the, to the that, table. Yeah. That was one of our best episodes because it was like snappy and no bullshit. Well I think I was I, I was thinking that I've been in the piano business for 47 years, which makes wow. me feel really old. Yeah. Um, and it occurred to me that in those 47 years, even though uh, I spent 25 years as a piano technician at a university, and it was a full-time job, it's on the side because uh, most universities don't pay very well if you're a piano technician. So uh, I always had this side business and I, and typically I, I grossed more in my side business than I did in my full-time job at the university. That's brutal. Uh, but over the years I've, and, and actually, so that was just 25 of the 47 years that I was at uh, the university. In the other 22 years, I, I was entirely self-employed. So I learned a lot, and I thought that I wanted to talk a little bit about what I've learned uh, about the business of being a piano technician. Uh, first of all, it's really important to get good training. And, and I'm talking about not only your basic training or your initial training in the business, but, uh, but continuing education. Uh, you need to be constantly working to improve your skills because this plays into how, how successful your business is going to be. I, I've always thought that in my business or in, in my career, about 25% of the skills and knowledge that I have as a piano technician came from my basic training, my initial training. <clears throat> and actually the longer I go, the smaller that percentage gets. I'd, it's probably down to about 15% now. But I, I can always keep learning. I think 25% or so of, of my career is due to my own ingenuity and things that I've figured out on my own. <clears throat> but the other 50%, I, I absolutely have to credit the Piano Technicians Guild and the, the various classes uh, that I've taken over the years, the journal articles I've read, the books I've read that were written by PTG members, and my associations with other piano technicians in the guild. Uh, I absolutely have to give at least half the credit to, to the guild for anything I might know now. The next thing I wanted to say is that as piano technicians, the only way to, uh, to achieve your greatest potential is to aim high. You, you've got to just aim <clears throat> you want to become as a piano technician where you want to be in the field. Uh, one reason for that is that the lower end of the market is gradually shrinking. Uh, spinets, consoles, old uprights, they're all disappearing from the market. What I say and, every class, every class I've ever taught in the piano business, I've said the low end is going away. And it yeah, is. Absolutely. And it just continues going away and the digitals are taking over that end of the market. This is not all bad, by the way. Uh, you know, I, I think most of us probably cut our teeth on old uprights and spinets and miserable pianos out there. Uh, even just tuning a spinet, uh, 
you know, really taxes our abilities. Almost, almost hopeless. But almost hopeless. That's, that's a big reason. And this is all the more reason to continue improving your skills in, in the business. Okay. My, one of my mission named Norman Niblett, he worked in, uh, he lived in LA and uh, he was a concert tuner tuned in recording studios and so forth. But he was an inspiration to me. And one thing he said uh, a long time ago that I've never forgotten is something to the effect that if, if you can make a radical change in the sound and the feel of a piano, you know, and if you can do it in a relatively short amount of time, you win. And it's absolutely true. If you have that ability to make the huge change in the sound and feel of the piano, people will seek you out. So you want to develop that ability. Aim high. Can I, can I just interrupt you real quick? Yeah. I feel like I've, I've heard that before. And I feel like I've heard it exactly that way before. Have I heard it from you, David, exactly that way before as well? Yes. Is that something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, that's a quote. That's a iconic, deathless, legendary quote of Nor- Norman Neblett. Got it. It's not just a paraphrase. Yeah. Because you both said it very much the same way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and actually, I have to confess that uh, I was kind of reviewing some old uh, handouts and things, and I did spot this on one of David's. Uh, class handouts so that's why it ended up sounding exactly the same it's great to hear from multiple Um, sources it's just such a simple truth about the high end of our business of our craft rather it's so Mm -hmm. simple you know yeah it it just is But, but now more than ever if you want to have a successful business that's the kind of thing you need to aim for that ability to transform an instrument, not just tune a piano. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk about one more topic along, and after that, we can just open it up for QA. Oh. Uh, but the, the, my last topic will be the longest. And this topic is. Uh, well, I'll, I'll lead into it with a story that my teacher told me <clears throat> 45, 50 years ago. Uh, there was a doctor in the old days when doctors trained other doctors who gathered his pupils together for one last lesson. And he said, this is going to be the most important lesson of all. And it's going to cost you a thousand dollars. So all of his students came together. They paid their thousand dollars, you know, and this was back in maybe the twenties or thirties when a thousand dollars was a huge amount of money. And he said, okay, here's the lesson. Don't forget to charge for your services. And he got up and walked out. Doctors get it. You have to charge for your services. Most other tradespeople get it. For some reason, most piano technicians don't get it. Is why, why do we give our services away too cheap? Uh, I think one reason is you could say, well, we don't have a trade union. Uh, you know, and uh, trades like electricians and carpenters and, and plumbers, they, they all have their unions and uh, that helps them kind of remain focused on, uh, on appropriate charges for their work. I personally think it's not such a bad thing that we don't have a trade union. Uh, but that may be one reason. Another reason I've always thought that uh, piano technicians tend to undercharge is that many piano technicians have a spouse or partner who has a real job with benefits. So they can afford their 
their business to treat their business more like a hobby instead of a business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't in terms of income to have a, a, a middle class life with all the benefits that that you would like to different situation that I have never had a spouse who had a real job with benefits. Uh, so I, in a way I've been forced to confront the issue of, you know, how do you, how do you run a business and make enough money that you can have a paid vacation and you can have medical insurance and, and uh, life insurance and all of the other perks. Uh, so I've had to confront that head on. Okay, I think another reason that most techs uh, undercharge is we tend to be good do-it-yourself people. I can remember when I was pretty new in this business and I was living in, in the Phoenix area. I can remember uh, cleaning out a clogged drain with, a, with an old bass string. You know, turning that into a snake that I, I could go into the drain and clean it out. It was pretty clever. Another piano technician taught me how to do that. And, and so we're good do-it-yourself people. We change our own oil and we... We do all of these things, you know, we... And, Instead of getting the carpet cleaners, we go to the grocery system or carpets. But whatever it is, I, I think that may be a factor in, in why we, we tend to undercharge. We don't really know what real tradespeople uh, and, and service people are charging. So we get stuck in this rut of, of charging too little and not raising our prices off enough. So I just wanted to uh, tell you, I guess, how much to charge because uh, economies in different areas are different. And, and so I, the, nothing I could say in terms of an actual figure would mean anything. <clears throat> but what I can do is encourage you to try and hire um, service pros of different kinds occasionally just to get a feel, you know, have a finger on the pulse of what's actually happening out there. Uh, minimum of $275 for a 20 minute service call. And that's just about what I charge for tuning. I'm working an hour and a half and they're working 20 minutes, but, but I find that I'm, I'm charging way more than most tuners in my area. Um, I, I want to tell you a little story about, uh, and I've over the years, but I some customers. It, it was a, a husband and wife, and they had two pianos. I inherited them from another technician who had retired, and this was a guy who didn't charge very much at all. He he really undercharged, but I went. Hey, Steve, you know what we might do? The first time to work on the upright. I might just hide your hmm? video for a minute so we can hear you better. I think it's, oh, okay. uh, for some reason, it's just kind of chopping out a little bit on us. Um, let me, uh, I'm going to stop your video. Just uh, keep chatting. I'll let you know. Okay. I'll let you know how that goes. Okay. Um, Okay, so I inherit these customers and they, they weren't used to paying a lot of money. I, so I went to work on the upright and I think this was, you know, 20 years ago, well, 15 years ago or so. And at any rate, I, uh, I tuned it, I did a full service job on it. I tuned it and I replaced a string all for my single full service fee, which at the time I think was $185. And I presented them with a bill and the, the husband looked at it and he said, $185 for an upright. I was uh, 
I was in kind of a weird mood that day. Uh, anyway, so when he complains about paying $185 for full service on an upride, I said to him, you know what? I charge, I pay more than that to get my rain gutters cleaned. And I, I have spent my entire career in this business. I'm a skilled service professional. I'm not some guy who spent two weeks learning how to clean rain gutters or two hours. So uh, he didn't say that he probably paid more than that to get his rain gutters cleaned too. But for some reason, you know, you know since, since the previous tech Technician yes, had been charging sure. who knows one hundred and twenty-five dollars or something. So, are we still having um, problems with audio? No. Yeah. Yes, sort of. Yeah, I I took you. I put your video back actually because we were still having it. So because um, I I wasn't sure maybe it just helped to be able to see you. I, I guess I'll try removing your video one more time. Um, hmm. Just. To, <laughs> Just to go back over what the story was, I think the de I think we got the details because I think the chopping allowed you to us to hear what you said. It just chopped it up a little bit, but um, basically, you you tuned the guy's piano. It was a, a, it was one hundred and eighty five dollars. You know, he kind of was really surprised about it, but you you mentioned you know that you pay more than that to clean your rain gutters and and you're you're just kind of saying you know I don't know if you said he actually agreed that he probably did did too or. I missed I, I kind of what his perspective on it was. Oh, what he said, okay, he didn't say anything. He, he didn't say anything at all. So um, I think the reason he didn't say anything was probably because he paid more than that to get his gutters cleaned also. So uh, uh, anyway, the point of the story is I, th I figured, well, I'll never see these people again. And uh, six months later, they called me to come back and tune both of their pianos. And I tuned them and I, with great trepidation of um, um, tunings. And uh, the man went into his office and wrote a check. He came back, handed me a check and he had given me a $50 tip. Wow. And I said, wow, that's very generous. I wasn't expecting that. He said, we just want you to know that we appreciate what you do. Wow. And uh, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind. When you think that, that, you know, you're already charging as much as you could possibly charge. And not only that, uh, since then, I now have a client who routinely gives me a hundred dollar tip every single time I tune his piano. And so if I charge 265, he gives me a check for 365. And he does it intentionally. He and again he I I said that's very generous. And he said we, we just want you to know we appreciate what you do. Wow. So keep that in mind. Okay. Yeah, it's now really... if someone go ahead. Okay, if someone calls or emails you and, and the first words that they say are, how much do you charge? They're not your kind of customer. Uh -uh. I'm sorry. They're, well, they're definitely not my kind of customer. It, it, because, okay, these are people who are going to have their piano tuned once every 10 years, whether it needs it or not. They're, they're not going to be the kind of customer you want. So what I do is I you just want to tell them exactly what you charge, you know, and it's good for shock value, I think. But, and then you just get out of there, you know, you know, just tell them the price and move on. Um, I've had similar experiences I, too. I'm sure probably David has as well, just where, where people provide tips, you know, and I think it's a mixture of things, you know, it, it's one that they're understanding the value of what you're doing. It's, it's another piece of, you know, 
recognizing that you care about what you do, you know, and you're not just there to, to pick up a check, right. you're there to do something special. Um, but yeah, some people, <laughs> they almost have a, they, they, they're almost hurt for you by how little you charge, you know, and those are the kind of people that you want to work with the one who, who kind of says, are you serious? You know, how are you surviving on that kind of a thing? Um, Cause it really is true. It really is right. true what you're saying. I'm going to just swallow. I never want to be seen as that person. I always want to be seen as Jesus. Mm. That cost a lot, didn't it? Well, yeah, but look, it's, it's great. You know, um, that's, that's the kind of person you want to be. That's what Brady's talking about. Um, everything is going to the high end. And the more you can be what's, doctors call a best practices operator the better it is mm -hmm. and the better your reputation is and the better you feel about yourself and the more you're confident right. Right. <laughs> that, that, it's a huge it's a it's an unending circle of getting better mm -hmm. and that's you look at steve brady and you just see that circle repeating again and again and again and again because he's you know, I, I hate to be like Charlie Sheen esque or whatever, but he's winning. He's 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 really succeeding in his craft and in life as a human being, obviously. And you know, he's rocking. And that's how we can be. We can be rocking. On that, I just want to just reach out to the people there that are watching us streaming. Just give you a quick warning. Uh, there should be a link in the chat that we put to, to join us uh, on the private call. But we're going to sign off the live stream. And then uh, if anybody wants to continue with us, just just register and you can join us on the private call. So, uh, uh, Steve, what I didn't mean to interrupt. We didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought. Uh, was that headed somewhere? Or did you want to go to Q&A or what are your thoughts? Well, I've got a couple couple more points. Uh, one is um, along the lines of you know, avoiding price shoppers. Uh, one thing I like, I like to publish my rate, my, my tuning fee on my website. And I find I don't get hardly any price shoppers anymore. If they've come to me through my website, they already know what I charge. And, and most the reason, another reason this is a good strategy is because most technicians don't do that. And I find that people, you know, rather than doing a, a long search on fees and everything, if they, if they find someone who is publishing their fee, they're going to go with you because nobody else is doing it. So, uh, you know, that's a strategy you might want to think about. And the last thing is, if uh, for any work you do where you're ordering parts, uh, it's important <clears throat> to realize that uh, at that point you are in a retail business or a retail mode. And uh, uh, having worked in a retail business for several years, I learned <clears throat> that a retail business is not going to survive unless they're making at least a 40% markup on what they're selling, at least a 40% markup. At Any less than least. that, they're not going to survive. At least. Yeah, at least. So what I do, and I'm, I, I do this just to avoid having to use a calculator. Uh, I, if, if I buy parts at a certain price, I charge the client twice that price. And that will usually end up really close to 40% markup uh, because the price uh, that I pay doesn't include shipping, doesn't include my time, uh, you know, making the order and everything. So a, a real simple way to do it is just double the, uh, the wholesale cost. And then that'll put you right really close to 40% markup. Oh. Um, so for years, I, you know, before I really figured this out, uh, I used to just pass along the parts at my cost, but you don't want to do that. 
you're just making it harder for your business to succeed. That's, that's op operating in a way that nobody else in the whole country operates. Yeah, I also want to get, I can, you know, I've thought about this okay. too and to sometimes do do well at, at implementing this or not various situations. But one thing that's helped me uh, understand, you know, the reasoning behind this, right? Like, like, let's say a client goes and they say, I'm going to go find this part online. I'm going to buy it myself, right? You know, this is, this is, uh, I've actually had that situation where there's a part that's needed and the client says, well, well, where, you know, where, where could I, I found this online. I can get it at this price, you know, I'll get it. You install it, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, a lot of what's interesting about those transactions is the client actually, has needed to interact with you in the first place in order to even find out what the part that is needed and find out sometimes even find out where it needs to be ordered from. And it's, it, these are subtle things that didn't, didn't, maybe they didn't used to be apparent, but I think it's becoming more apparent, at least to me, that that's part of my expertise. And that's part of why there may, why I can rationalize making an upcharge on different parts and things like that. And if clients, I think it should be reasonable for clients to expect that, you know, if they were to research it and say, Oh, what you got this for half of what you're charging me, you know, they, it should be reasonable just as it is when they go to the grocery store, if they were to find out how much did they pay for that carton of milk, you know, we don't expect the grocery store to charge us wholesale on the carton of milk that we buy that we expect there to be a markup. So yeah, I think it, there's some sort of level of respect from the client in saying, okay, I understand that's that's another way in which you're compensated for your for your expertise. Right, and if they if they refuse to uh, to look at it that way, then again, I think that's the kind of client you don't really want. You don't want want or need or care about. Right. right. Yeah. But uh, at this point in my career, I'm I'm actually easing into retirement. Uh, uh, I brought on an associate and. I'm turning over more and more of the tuning business to her. I still, you know, I'm fully involved in the shop, but, you know, I've been in the business a long time. It's been very good to me financially, but in large part, because I've, I've treated it like a real business. Uh, get yourself an accountant. Uh, it's another good thing to do. Um, can I just interject here with something I just found out and I'm kind of disappointed I just found it out on these lines. Go ahead and I'll try to find a link during this session. Go ahead and look up something called the Solo 401. And I was for some reason not aware of this investment vehicle, you know, offered by the government that's ta you can invest tax free for your retirement. And you can invest way, way more um, than some other instruments that you can invest through because if you're self-employed, if you're an independent um, business person, what they call like a sole proprietor, you can actually contribute to that retirement both through you as your employer, as your quote unquote employer and as an employee. And so you can contribute up to and sometimes much more than 25% of your income to a, a retirement account tax-free. And sometimes you can even, uh, depending on how little you make, the less you make, the more percentage of your income you can contribute using these one of these solo 401ks. I'll put a little link in the chat there. Sorry to interrupt, good, good. Steve. I'm just excited okay, about at that. This point, uh, at this point, I would just like to you know, open it up to Q and A. For sure. So what happens when you're in a phone call, it's 10 minutes in, they really sound great, feels great. Then suddenly they say, so how much is it? And you tell them and they say, there's a second and a half pause. And then they say, you know, I should talk to my husband about this. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. One, this is one reason why I really try to avoid phone calls with with potential clients. Uh, 
in fact, on my website, I think I don't even post my phone number. Uh, I post my email address. So they get my phone number after they're already my clients, you know, but yeah, I, it's, uh, I used to waste so much time on phone calls. And another thing I hate about phone calls is it's so hard to extricate yourself from them. And so they end up being big time wasters. I, I like email because I can do it on my own time. I can, I can invest as much or as little time as I feel is necessary for that particular interaction. Yeah. Let's see if there's um, some more questions here. I've got a question from Phil Bondi. He says, how much voicing do you do at a service call? Oh, That's a great okay. question. Hi, hi Phil. Uh, you know, I do a little voicing at almost every, every call uh, because I do full service. And to me, that means I come in, I, I look at the piano, maybe play it a little bit, just get a sense for, for what it needs. And whatever stands out the most to me is, is what I'm going to attack first. Uh, I, would, I would say that in full service, um, one thing you always want to check is the pedals because pedals tend to develop problems. So why not make that the first thing you look at? I, I look at the tuning. What is the state of the tuning? How bad is it? Where's the pitch? How much time am I probably going to need for that? And then another thing I do is what I call spot voicing. I like to, because I work on a lot of high end pianos and you want them to be as even as possible and sound as good as possible. So I, uh, I do a lot of spot voicing. I would say almost every call, I'm going to pick out maybe the three uh, worst or, or the three notes that stick out the most one way or the other and try to do something about them. So that's, that's the answer to that question. I, I do it at almost every call. I want to, there's a couple more questions that are coming in, which are great. I want to cut back because I, I kind of cut in with, with my comment when you were in the middle of talking about hiring an accountant. I'm sure that could stand on its own, but do you have anything further to say about hiring an accountant? Um, I know there's a bookkeeper, Steve Gallen, um, who, who probably can help you because he, he's a piano industry guy who works with, um, what is it? He, he works with the ham, hammer, uh, hammer maker Ronson talking no, no. about John Gallon. John Gallon. John Gallon. I forget what it yeah. John Gallen, what is he yeah. he yeah. works yeah. for Brooks. For Brooks. Right, right. Um but yeah, any did you how did you find an accountant? Do you pay how much do you typically have to pay for an accountant? Any any other details about uh using an accountant? Um I you know for most of my career I didn't use an accountant. But when I started getting serious about selling my business you know, and about that idea, uh, I did hire an accountant and I just went on Thumbtack and, you know, said, I'm looking for an accountant. I got a lot of people contacting me immediately. Thumbtack is like that. And, um, and so I interviewed three of them and, uh, determined the one I wanted to use. So uh, the one I found was, was local, uh, she, she has a bachelor's and a master's in accounting science, and she's working on a, a doctorate in business administration. And she had the lowest rates of the three that I interviewed. So it was a pretty easy choice for me. I'm paying right now, I think I pay her under $200 a month. It varies a little bit depending on how much time she has to spend and what I'm asking her to do. But basically, I'm asking her to do a, uh, a profit and loss statement each month and a balance sheet. These are just traditional financial uh, reports or statements that you want to have. Uh, I had, there's some setup time. I had to hook her up. We, we set up a uh, QuickBooks online account together that we can both access. We can, and in fact, we can both access the, the account at the same time. 
and uh, I have to uh, send her statements from all of my various bank accounts, credit card accounts, and retirement accounts, and so forth. But she takes those statements and creates the the uh, financial reports. Uh, but anyway, it's been very good for me because I've had to get a little more disciplined in my own accounting, just keep on top of things more. Uh, I, I used to basically save the accounting until I was doing my taxes. And then I would spend days trying to put it all together. Uh, now taxes are going to be easy. Um, let's see, any... Oh, here's a good question. Do these tips on pricing apply to new technicians just starting out that are trying to build up a business from nothing? You know, that's a hard question to answer, but uh, I would say, yes, they do apply. You're, you're going to, when you're starting out, you basically take every job that you can possibly get, but try to keep on the higher end of the, of the, the uh, price spectrum in your area. Um, because, you know, it's much easier to, to start there than to have to suddenly raise your prices a lot sometimes, sometime later. Um, also, you, you know, like people have said, if some people, the kind of clients you want to attract are people who believe that you get what you pay for. Right. And people who believe that the best technicians are going to be charging more. So naturally, you want to put yourself into that conversation. Uh, and gradually, yeah, you will be taking probably business that eventually you'll, you won't want to have. But you can gradually drop that business. Uh, and I've, you know, I can't tell you how many technicians I have talked to who are afraid to raise their rates, but they're, they're complaining to me that they're, they're too busy. They have got too much business and you know, it's driving them nuts. They can't keep up with that. And I always tell them, you know, there are very few problems in our business that can't be solved by raising your rates. And this and is- what are, what's, their, what's, what's their barrier? Is it, a, is it like a psychological fear? What is it? I think it is. I think it is a psychological fear. I, I, I just, but it makes no sense to me. They refuse to use, lose, to raise their rates. If you, if you raise your rates, yeah, say they're afraid they're going to lose clients. You raise your rates, you lose a few. I've always found I didn't lose that many. But, but what do you want to do? You want to be working... Uh, over time and making X amount of dollars, or do you want to be working a lot less and still making X amount of dollars so it, and working on stuff that you really want to work on? I, I talked to, I had lunch with a, a friend of mine, a technician who I respect a lot as a technician, but we got talking about what our average workday looked like. And he said, I tune five pianos a day. I said, what do you charge? He said, $125. Oh I said, man, why don't you raise your rates? I can't remember what his excuse was, but you know, people have excuses. And I don't. And was, it, was it having to do with some economic uh, specific micro, you know, situation in that, in that place? No, or? I don't think so. He, okay, I live in Seattle. He lives in Portland. I don't think the two cities are that different. No. I could see charging a little less in Portland, but you know, he was charging less than half what I was charging. And I, I just don't understand it. Okay, I have a question here uh, from Eric Johnson. Uh, do you recommend yearly price increases, uh, like s small regular increases yeah. or more infrequent raises for a larger amount? I absolutely recommend raising by a small percentage every year. And almost every year I do that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm talking about raising by about 5% a year. Right. You know, you're basically keeping up with inflation. And, and most people aren't going to notice a change that small. When you suddenly change by 20%, people are going to notice. 
But by the way, when you do raise their price, when you raise, they might notice on one direction, but they may also ask themselves, hmm, they might be actually thinking, what's making them worth more? I wonder, right? I mean, like, <laughs> they may be intrigued that you raised your prices. Um, I, it, it may not apply to everyone in this meeting, right? But if you pass your PTG exam, right? you become an RPT, what a great opportunity to go ahead and raise your prices a significant amount. And when people ask you why, you can say, hey, I'm officially certified now. You know, I've been, I've been doing a great job, but now it's official and I can prove it. So I'm raising my prices, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Find good reasons to now when I, when I started doing the full service method, I changed, I raised my rates by, I think about $15 dollars or so. Um, so I think I went from about 185 up to, uh, well, no, it was even less than that. Uh, it might have been 170 to 185, something like that. Uh, that was a pretty big jump. Um, and some people noticed, I, I felt uncomfortable with raising that amount all at once, but I didn't lose that many clients. Just a few, but I always felt the need to explain what I'm doing here is I'm changing to a full service approach rather than just straight tuning. And, and uh, you know, I, I felt the need to explain that to people, but I found over the years people really didn't pay much attention to that. <laughs> and now I don't even uh, spend the time explaining it. You know, I just, I, charge it i do full service some duty is asking can you list your full service i've got a private question that came a little bit while back when you're ready but you can you can hop okay. into that one um no i can't list my full service because it varies um but the basic approach is i evaluate the piano before i start working on it and i, I address the thing that jumps out at me most i address that first if it's a squeaky pedal, I do that first. If it's uh, that there are some notes that don't play or the stick, or if there's a broken string or whatever it is, I'm going to address that thing first. Or if the people tell me something, I always try to ask them, you know, uh, are there any particular issues you'd like me to look at? If, if they say there are, you address those first. Yeah. And so basically I do as much as I can to improve the piano, addressing the worst things first, as much as I can do in about 90 minutes. And I, sometimes I'll go over, I'll do 100 minutes, 105 minutes, but, but that, that's my basic approach. It's called, it's called triage. It's, it's like wartime. Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. You, you do the worst first. If you can't fix it, then you just leave it. And it's just, you make decisions about what you do. And that's, I, that becomes a huge part of your skill as a piano technician to identify and zen down the three or four or five things that you could do to make a the most radical positive change in the shortest amount of time and do that. And when you get good at mm -hmm. that, when you get good at that, it'll be like, holy God, what did you do to this piano in two hours? My God. Because you now have the skill of saying, oh, well, it needs this and this and this and this, and then it'll sound way better than it does now. Here's a question that came I direct to me. Let me hop in with it. Um, it says, uh, ask Steve about the classic, Steve Brady broke a hammer off. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. That was when I was I was working at a high end dealership. I think I was servicing a uh, Falcone concert grand. Ooh. This was probably 20, 25 years ago. Um, and so uh, I'm uh, there are a couple of other technicians in the store that have kind of gathered behind me to look at, uh, to watch what I was doing. I was doing some voicing. And uh, I had the action out on my lap and I had one hammer up 
that I had been doing something on. And I turned around to talk to them and explain what I was doing. And then I turned quickly back around and started pushing the action back in. And of course there was a hammer up and before I'd even hit the stretcher, I knew it was gonna break, but I couldn't stop it. Uh, so that was kind of embarrassing. Fortunately, I carried, you know, spare runner shanks. And so I was yeah, able to- Yeah, baby. So, <laughs> that's that story. Okay. And uh, who asked that question anyway? I, I'm not I sure. Oh, they're, they're raising their hand. You know what? I'm going to let them unmute because I think maybe they want to say something. It's not clear who it is. It just says iPhone. You're oh. unmuted or you have the ability to unmute iPhone. Who is this? I believe I gave you the ability to unmute and I requested your unmute. Okay. We, they can hop in whenever they're ready, but uh, there's no name. I'm not sure who it is. <laughs> Clearly it's somebody who knows you. They had, they had another comment about it. It had something to do with humility and it didn't seem like that came out in the way that you relayed the story. Um, so I, I'm not sure if there was another piece of it that they were looking for you to share. Oh, sounds like a troll with a personal grudge. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Actually, this this came up in another conversation recently. The full arm smash to test stability. Any? Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that and maybe your reasoning oh. behind it? Oh yeah. You know, I I don't know. You you put something out there and it takes on a life of its own. There and you this go. Has definitely happened with the forearm. Uh, you know, I, I did not invent it. Uh, I got it from Rick Baldison, who got it from Norman Nibla. Uh, but, but the problem was I gave it a name. And I gave it such a, a, a catchy name that people are forever associating it with me. Uh, here's the deal with, with the forearm smash. It's, um, it's a te technique I use very, very rarely. It's only in a case where, say I'm called to tune for a concert and they, you know, they forgot to call the tuner. And so I can't even tune it until after the last rehearsal. And I'm, and I, I'm raising the pitch on it by say eight cents. <clears throat> then, you know, and I have one shot to get this piano tuned and stabilize. Well, the forearm smash is a really good technique in that case, because I can do a tuning, raise the pitch quickly, I can do the forearm smash, and then I can kind of pick up the pieces, and it results in a stable tuning. So that's, I, I don't use this in people's homes, I don't want to frighten people. Uh, sometimes when I used to do it on the stage, uh, you know, the stage crew would be Look, looking at each other and going, oh, poor Steve, you know, he's finally losing it because I'm doing this smash thing. But, uh, you know, the idea is you just want to get the whole soundboard moving. And no matter how hard you hit one note when you're tuning, you can't, you can't replicate what's going to happen when a concert pianist is playing Liszt. No. It's just not possible. So this is a way of kind of pre- uh, conditioning the piano to what's going to happen. I hope that helps. It does. And it's so much uh, cl more clarifying than that forearm smash. That just denotes something, some violent, you know, repeated. No. Like... And it's not, and I'm not actually playing it that hard. I'm just using my arm weight to, uh, to get all of the keys playing at the same time and all the pounding at I the know. same time. It's, it's not about force, it's about sound. Exactly. And it sounds like it's also about resonance, getting, getting the right. piano resonating, all the different yeah. frequencies. Is, getting, yeah. I think of it as getting the soundboard and bridges moving. Yeah. More than I could do by playing. Fully, them. like fully vibrating, right? Yeah, right, right. That's because right. Things, Things happen, weird, you know, things happen when you're doing, when the soundboard is moving like that. Well, yeah, especially when you have no damp on it at all, just free yeah. resonance. It's, it's uh, fascinating. And then hitting the notes at 
flexion speed at speed at distortion speed or whatever you want to say it's uh, fascinating i'll cut in here just to remind us all we just got a few minutes left uh thanks so far for what you've added steve a lot of great stuff so we got a lot on business and then we've went to other categories it's been really good we put a little link in the chat there's a couple links one is for feedback so please as always we like to hear your thoughts what went well for you today what could be improved uh, there's another link to join the convention for december and we have reduced pricing at the moment and so you'll definitely get the best deal possible if you sign up before uh, november 10th and then finally, make sure and join us for Jude Reveille's masterclass coming up yeah. um, on the 21st of November. He's going to talk about turbocharging the grand action. Um, he's just a really a stellar rebuilder who has a lot of unique and forward thinking ideas about optimizing piano. So that should be a, a lovely event as well. Um, we still got a few minutes left, but I just wanted to make sure we covered those bases. Um, Steve, Anything you want to kind of launch us into as we part or, or kind of have some to, uh, parting words? Some really things I wanted to read from the chat. Uh, John Ross says, I have found that when I raise my pricing, I attract more business, a greater perception that you are a true professional. I like that. Uh, Forrest Halford says, build a solid relationship and they won't go away. Oh, um, Pat, someone this week complimented me for raising my rates and then posted all over Facebook how great I was. So there you have it. Yeah, it's good. I, and one thing that I've noticed too, you know, I, I do some coaching for people who are starting various types of businesses. And so this this concept of charging and connecting with clients and things like this comes up. And one thing that's really useful to point out is that um, there is for every individual, there's a certain audience that's going to be willing to pay a premium for working with you. And that may be different than the individual that's willing to pay a premium for working with somebody else. So for example, you know, somebody who really loves David Anderson and the way that he handles pianos they want to pay a premium because he resonates with them, right? And it could be a totally different person with Steve. And so the idea that you're charging more, it's not something that applies generally even, you know, it's you have to find your specific audience of people who love oh, to work with you that's and right. recognize that, you know, it's going to be worth it to an audience. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good point. Okay, uh, David, any, any parting words from you? Just that being with uh, like an obvious, ridiculously obvious, uh, you know, uh, master piano technician is a pure pleasure. It's, it's, it's a joy because it's so simple. So simple. Steve yep. Brady is one of the simplest human beings. And the same thing with pianos. He's, he breaks things down to a very simple place because that's where life actually exists. And it's tremendously inspiring. So listening to him and listening to his experiences, expiring in it, it, it it triggers off mine and it triggers off other people's I'm sure. And it's, you know, it's a great time. It's a valuable time. Well, so thanks Stevie. Really. Thank you. Stevie. Brother. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> All right. My you take dear. Care and get yes, I will. My brother. Listen, all my dear friends in the piano tech, Radio Hour community, thank you so much. Never could do this without you guys. So thanks. Yeah, it's been lovely, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week. And hopefully we'll see you at that conference in December. I'll uh, sign off and we'll catch you all on the flip side. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. 
Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week. 